Well, what, is, what does freedom require? Well, let's start psychologically. What kind of psychology wants freedom? Think of it in the reverse. What kind of psychology wants authoritarianism? What kind of psychology wants limits on itself, wants to be told what to do, wants to be restricted, wants to be constrained, wants to be enslaved? Well, a psychology that's afraid, that has no confidence in itself, a human being that is terrified of the world, terrified of reality, terrified of his ability to survive within the world. It's a low self-esteem culture, a culture of people who don't have any confidence in their own life, who don't really believe that they belong, that don't have confidence in their mind to guide them to survive, to thrive, to be successful. And they want to be told because they're too scared, petrified, paralyzed to think for themselves. And maybe they don't have the tools to think for themselves. So a culture of fear, a culture of irrationality, and a culture of low self-esteem is a culture that is ready for authoritarianism. Now, what is the opposite of that? Well, the opposite of that is a culture of confident individuals with self-esteem. And what does self-esteem mean? It doesn't mean, oh, I feel good about myself. Everybody gets a ribbon. I got patted on my back by somebody else. I might be okay because my teacher said I'm okay. Or my parents said I'm okay. Or my friends said oh, I'm okay. Or, you know, people out there think I'm okay. Then I must be okay. No, self-esteem is something you own for yourself through achievement, through success, through attaining values, rational values, not any values, rational values, values that are pro-life, the pro-your life. And self-esteem is a sense, not just, oh, life, you know, life is good, I'm happy or whatever. No, self-esteem is a deep sense of efficacy, a belonging, of this world is mine. I can survive and thrive in this world, on this planet. And life, it's not just that I can survive. It's not just that I'm worthy of surviving. It's not just that they have the competence to survive. But I'm worthy of happiness, and I can achieve happiness. I'm confident in my ability to be happy, to attain happiness, to be successful in everything that it is about life. It's about men and women standing tall, embracing life, loving life, loving their own existence in this world. Confident, confident, confident in their ability to live and to be happy. Not relying on other people for the self-esteem. Not relying on other people for this happiness. Not relying on others to pat them on the back. Because they don't need that. Because in the se sense, in a sense of self-esteem, in a sense of their happiness, they are self-contained. They can achieve it. Other people are important. Other people are great. But other people don't sustain you. You sustain you. You sustain yourself. And the only way that somebody can attain this kind of self-esteem, the kind of self-esteem that I can imagine somebody like George Washington had, that the founding fathers generally had, the kind of self-esteem that leads you to rebel against the mightiest military force in human history, the kind of self-esteem that leads you to want to be free, to want to make your own choices in life, to make your own decisions in life, want to determine your own destiny. And what does that require? Well, it requires a deep respect for one's own mind. And this is exactly last time when I did the show about 
the, the prerequisites, the cultural prerequisites that made possible the enlightenment and that would be needed for objectivism. This plays a huge role. There's no way America is founded without, without a scientific revolution. Newton, in that respect, not only John Locke, but Newton is one of the founding founders of this country. Because it is through the scientific revolution that men got that respect for reason, and it's through that respect for reason and, and the use of reason and the understanding of the power and efficacy of reason is how they gained the self-esteem necessary to view their lives as individuals as important. You can't get individualism without the efficacy of reason. Individualism is the recognition of the ability of the individual to think for himself, live for himself, strive for himself, succeed for himself. And therefore, as the individual, as the sovereign unit, as the autonomous unit, politically. And therefore, you cannot get an American Revolution. You cannot get a John Locke fully thought out without the scientific revolution. So, imagine this culture in which we have this immense respect for reason thinking that we believe that the mind is this amazing tool not not some deterministic computer that is determined by our genes and just runs its course based on the programming already embedded in it no reason embodies in it the ability to choose the concept of self, again, the concept of, of, of free will, and, and, and think again about the concept of, of self esteem. How can you have self esteem if you don't have free will? It's meaningless. It's meaningless to talk about I, it's meaningless to talk about self. If you are impotent, if you are just a product of atoms bouncing around and, 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 you know, physical causality. So, the only way to have self-esteem is to recognize that you determine your own fate. You determine the content of your own consciousness. You determine, you shape your own soul. You make who you are. Your choices are what determine what you become. So when you talk about self-esteem, self means you. Something that modern psychology and modern philosophy and so many of these determinists eliminate from our world. There is no self. So a world of people who recognize their self as the determining factor. A world of self-esteem. A world that respects reason. And as a consequence, a world of courage. A world of people who are embracing challenges. Who embrace uncertainty. Who embrace risk. Who embrace the world out there. Who are eager every morning to get up and go see what challenges the world throws at them. Not sitting around and moping and complaining and bitching but who are alive, fully alive. Because they value their life too much to be passive. People who are constantly wanting new challenges, wanting new choices, wanting new paths. And then people like that, well, of course they don't want the state telling them what they can or cannot do, what businesses they can or cannot open, what lines of research they can or cannot engage in, who they can and cannot employ, how much they should pay the people they employ or don't employ or whatever. No, they want to be left alone to succeed, to fail, 
to get back up on their feet, to go at it again, because it's fun. Because it means they're alive. So, what would it take to get us to a world of self-esteem, respect for reason, courage, a world in which we recognize the importance of free will and our own capacity to shape our own lives? Well, I mean, where are we today? We're, we're at the exact opposite position. So we take real philosophical challenges to the dominant intellectual views in the world today. It would take a complete and upper, utter turning over of our educational institutions, a complete rejection of progressive education, a complete rejection of the whole self-esteem movement, a complete rejection of the idea that school is there to socialize us, a school is there to automatize us, a school is there to train us to be workers in some mythical factory, that, in the manufacturing jobs that Trump is going to bring back to America. It would have to be a complete upheaval in our educational system because you can't take adults, let's say over the age of 30 or over the age of 40, and turn them around. It just is unthinkable that you can, somebody can change his self-esteem late in life, in middle age. Or somebody can suddenly, after years of not caring about reason, gain a respect for reason. Or that somebody who's been fearful their entire life suddenly embraces risk and challenges. I mean, it happens, but it's unusual. It's unusual. I am to begin with. I wonder if I can ask you to capsulize, I know this is difficult, can I ask you to capsulize your philosophy? What uh, is Randism? Uh, first of all, I do not call it Randism, and I don't like that name. All I right. call it Objectivism. All right. Meaning, a philosophy based on objective reality. Now, let me explain it as briefly as I can. First, my philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute, that man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it, and that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality which has so far been believed impossible, namely, a morality not based on faith. On or faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not on arbitrary edict mystical or social, but on reason, a morality which can be proved by means of logic, which can be demonstrated to be true and necessary. All right, all right. Now, may I define what my morality is? All right. Because this is merely an introduction. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on earth, and to live as a human being, he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold reason as his only guide to action, and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind, that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness, and that he must not force other people, nor accept their right to force him that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. May uh, I interrupt now? You may. Because you bring, you, you put this philosophy to work in your novel Atlas Shrugged. That's right. You demonstrate it in, in human terms in your novel Atlas Shrugged. And let me start by quoting from a review of this novel Atlas Shrugged that appeared in Newsweek. It said that you are out to destroy Almost every edifice in the contemporary American way of life, our Judeo-Christian religion, our modified government-regulated capitalism, our rule by the majority will, other reviews have said that you scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? Uh, yes. 
I agree with the facts, but not the estimates of this criticism. Namely, if I am challenging the base of all these institutions, I'm challenging the moral code of altruism, the precept that man's moral duty is to live for others, that man must sacrifice himself to others, which is the present day morality. What do you Since mean by I sacrifice himself for others? This now we're moment. getting to the point. One moment. Since I'm challenging the base, I necessarily would challenge the institutions you name, which are a result of that morality. All right. And now what is self-sacrifice? Yes, what is self-sacrifice? You say that you do not like the altruism by which we live. You, you like a certain kind of Ayn Randist selfishness. I uh, would say that I don't like is too weak a word. I consider it evil. And uh, self-sacrifice is the precept that man needs to serve others in order to justify his existence, that his moral duty is to serve others. That is what most people believe today. Well, yes, we're taught to feel concerned for our fellow man, to feel responsible for his welfare, to feel that we are, as religious people uh, might put it, children under God and responsible one for the other. Now, why do you rebel? What's wrong with this philosophy? But that is what, uh, in fact, makes man a sacrificial animal. That man must work for others, concern himself with others, or be responsible for them. That is the role of a sacrificial object. I say that man is entitled to his own happiness and that he must achieve it himself, but that he cannot demand that others give up their lives to make him happy. I'm and right. nor should he wish to sacrifice himself for the happiness of others. I hold that man should have self-esteem. And cannot man have self-esteem if he loves his fellow man? What's wrong with loving your fellow man? Christ, every important moral leader in man's history, has taught us that we should love one another. Why, then, is this kind of love, in your mind, immoral? It is immoral if it is a love placed above oneself. It is more, more than immoral, it's impossible. Because when you are asked to love everybody indiscriminately, that is, to love people without any standard, to love them regardless of the fact of whether they have any value or virtue, you are asked to love nobody. But in a sense, in your book, you talk about love as if it were a business deal of some kind. Isn't the essence of love that it is above, uh, above self-interest? Uh, well, let me m make it uh, concrete for you. What would it mean to have love above self-interest? It would mean, for instance, that a husband would tell his wife, if he were moral, according to the conventional morality, that I am marrying you just for your own sake. I have no personal interest in it, but I am so unselfish that I am marrying you only for your own good. Well, should would, husbands and wives tally up? Would any woman up? like that? Should husbands and wives I tally up at the end of the day and say, well, now, wait a minute. I love her if she's done enough for me today, or she loves me if, if I have properly performed oh, my functions. Is no. You misunderstood me. That is not uh, how love should be treated. I agree with you that it should be treated like a business deal, but every business has to have its own terms and its own kind of currency. And in love, the currency is virtue. You love people not for what you do to, for them or what they do for you. You love them for the values, the virtues, which they have achieved in their own character. You don't love causelessly. You don't love everybody indiscriminately. You love only and then, those who deserve it. And Using then, the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to iranbookshow.com slash su support or go to subscribestar.com you're on Brooks show and um, and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going i'm not sure when the next